Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review Part 8, and this is Session 69. All right, as I said at the very end of the last session, faith is something that normally we think about that we have in God. But there are multiple times that Paul uses faith in a different way. I want us to look at them, and this is going to be a big improvement over what we did last time. So, so th let's look at the different ways that we encounter faith. Here's the first one. Romans 3.1 What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. Chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. I don't need to read any further. We got where we wanted. What is the faith of God? God's not saying he has faith in someone else to do something. This word, and we're going to define it, but when it's using faith in that way, it's not, and by the way, shall their unbelief make the faith of God, not faith in God. So if it's the faith of God, then there's something God is doing. That's right. And that faith, I'm just going to put it up here and we'll see it. But when the Bible uses the word faith in that way, it is not talking about God believing in someone. It is talk about his faithful, last week I called it his faithful performance. Or him being faithful to do something he said he would do. And I know we don't today use the word faith in that way. But it is very common in your Bible, and it was not uncommon to use it that way back then. So let me just show this to you, so let's work our way through. So, that faith is not talking about God believing in someone else, and it's not talking about someone else believing in God. Instead, he says, Matt, can we just read the rest of it? He says, if some didn't believe, shall their unbelief make what God faithfully performed to, to be without effect? In other words, if some people didn't believe, then the, did that negate what God did? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, talking about God, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings. See, here's another word. We know what justification is. Did God have to be justified like he had to get eternal life by believing in something? No. No. Okay. So, now, um, here's another example. This, the faith of God, let me put it down this way, because that's what that is talking about. The faith of God is God's faithfulness to do what he said he would do or what he promised. That's what the faith of God is. Do you, do you at least understand what I've written on the board? Now let's go through another scripture. Here's another example of it. In other words, the question is here, because some people believe, does that mean that God's faithfulness to do what he promised is now without effect. In other words, it was for nothing. Do you see? Now, when you read it that way, the question makes perfect sense. Now, here's the next one. Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. In other words, how does anybody get the righteousness of God? Well, that righteousness is provided by something Jesus Christ did. Yeah, it's his faithful performance to function as the Redeemer. So now it's the faith of Jesus Christ. In the previous verse, it was the faith of God. Now, a lot of people think that that is a wrong translation, that it should have been faith in Jesus Christ. But when you go back to the Greek, it is actually of. So it is translated properly. 
Some people think that's another way of saying faith in Jesus. But if that's how you read it, you're blinding yourself now to a very important doctrine. That faith is used to talk about God's faithfulness to do what He promised. In this case, Jesus Christ's faithfulness to do what was needed to provide the righteousness of God to people. That's the only way. What, don't, don't we believe that? The only reason we can get that righteousness is because of what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay. So, in verse 22, let me see if that one's going to come up here. Paul says, that's the, that's the one that we're, that we're looking at here. Uh, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. kind of lost my spot here. He's not talking about Jesus having faith in someone. He's talking about what Jesus faithfully performed. Okay. Um, here's the next one. Galatians chapter 2, verse 15. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, the way I'm looking at that faith and the way the Bible intends for us to look at it is we're not justified by the law. The way a person gets justified is because of what Jesus faithfully performed on our behalf. Okay? Even we... Now, now here comes the part we're doing. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. See, we believed in Him that we might be justified by His faithful work, not our faithful work. Do you see? So this whole thing is about that. See, it might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So he's talking about the difference is, on one hand, people are depending on what they can do. On the other hand, we're depending on what he did. Do you see the difference? So it's his faithful performance. So, all right. Now, Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Well, let's read my definition in. But... Uh, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that what God faithfully promised to do was performed by Jesus Christ and it might be given to them that believe. Do you see how he's using that faith? So when you see that preposition of, the faith of God, faith of Jesus Christ, then you're seeing it is their faithfulness to do what was promised what was needed, what was necessary. Okay, so now, now that we've talked about that faith for a little bit, and by the way, you know what he's performing? He's performing that which we cannot do for ourselves. It's impossible for us to accomplish on our own. It's not, he's just helping us out. Okay, now with that in mind, that's, that's the faith of Christ. When we look at the book of, in the book of Ruth, I'm going to give you a little aside here. When, in fact, I have this on the PowerPoint. When you, I think I have it on the PowerPoint. I do not have it on the PowerPoint. It's in purple in my notes, which means it's supposed to be on the PowerPoint. In the book of Ruth, if you remember what that's about, it's about Ruth. <laughs> okay, I'm such a deep theologian. And Boaz is functioning as her kinsman redeemer. Now, a redeemer isn't always about sin. Sometimes it's about paying a debt that someone else can't pay. And, and so Boaz, is, is, he's related to her, so he's her kinsman. And then he is going to redeem her. He's going to do that for her, which she cannot do for herself. Jesus, for the nation of Israel, is a kinsman redeemer. How is he a kinsman? He came as a Jew. And we know about the redemption part. He is doing something to forgive their sins that they could never do on their own. I sure wish I had put this on the PowerPoint because there are two requirements when someone... Anyway, in the book of Ruth, 
you have these two requirements. There were requirements for someone to be a redeemer. They're actually pretty common sense, but they were necessary, and they're outlined in the book of Ruth. Now, I didn't want to go do a study on Ruth, so I'm just going to mention these for you. What would you think? You have these in your notes? You do? Okay, well, then you can see them. The, fir the, the first thing is the Redeemer had to be capable of performing the redemption. So let's say, let's say I, I owe a debt. I owe a debt to Clinton. And I owe Clinton $5,000. And Clinton is, you know, coming by and you know, I need my money and all of that. And one day, Mark and I are sitting on the front porch and Clinton comes by and he says, hey, I need my money. And Mark goes, you know what? I'll take care of that for you. Well, in order for Mark to do that, he has to be able to come up with $5,000, doesn't he? That just makes sense. So the first requirement for a redeemer, if I could put this into a single word, I know I've got a whole deal here, but he has to be, he has to be capable of being able to do that. Now, I, I think that just makes sense. And um, by the way, if you're not capable, you just can't perform the redemption. That's it. You may want to, but intention will not be enough. And there, there is another piece to this. If someone was truly going to provide the redemption, they had to be able to do it without harm to themselves. In other words, Mark, he goes and he sells his house for $3,000. He sells all of his vehicles for $1,000. And then uh, he auctions his children off into indented servitude for a year for the other thousand. And then he's got his five thousand and he pays Clinton my debt. But you know what? Mark is ruined after that. And then he goes, hey, can I live with you? And I'm going, uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm being funny. So <laughs> Mark's thinking, not too funny. Okay, but... You understand? If he ruins himself in the process, not, not redemption. Okay? All right, now here's the second one. The Redeemer had to faithfully perform everything required. Everything that the redemption. In other words, he couldn't just do partial or part of it. He had to be able to do it all. So let's suppose Mark is a multi-billionaire. He could give Clinton that 5000 without any problem at all. But suppose he goes, I tell you what, Clinton, I, you're never going to get, he can't get blood out of a turnip, so I'm going to give you three, and we'll just call it even. Does that qualify for the, no, it doesn't. Aren't you glad that when Jesus is performing redemption for us, He not only is capable of performing it all, He has the ability to do it, but He covers every single piece of it. Everything that was needed. He provided for all of it. That is the faith of Jesus Christ. That is His faithful performance. He is capable and He does everything necessary for the complete redemption to be accomplished. So I just took us, I just talked about, and take us over to Ruth, I just talked about that to say that with those things, this phrase comes into focus a little better. So the faith of God is His faithfulness to do what He promised to do. Okay, now, the other thing is, the one who gets redeemed is entirely dependent upon the one doing the redemption. He can't, he can't do it. It's not a teamwork. 
It's just the Redeemer providing everything. So let me take you now to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 11. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. Isn't that true? Our righteousness, it would just be from trying to keep the law, see? All right. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now that last faith is, you know what? That's something different. But when he talks about, but that which is through the faith of Christ... He's talking about that which is through the faithful performance of Jesus Christ. It's not our faithfulness to the law. It's His faithfulness to do everything for us that we could not do for ourselves. And so, by the way, this is in a context where it's talking about we have boldness and access. The reason we have boldness and access is because of what Jesus Christ faithfully performed. That's the faith of Jesus Christ in that. Okay. So, you see that the faith of Christ, by the way, isn't just for providing for the forgiveness of sins. He's also providing for us to have access and boldness before God. So when it says, he's, he has to, he's, everything that's required, he's able to cover, Jesus did so much more. Look, how many years was it that all I understood about that was Jesus died for my sins? Jesus died for my sins. He did so much more than that. Every bit of this other stuff that we were talking about, the fact that He not only forgave our sins, but He imputed righteousness to us. He gave us a standing in Jesus Christ. We're by no longer enemies, but we're at one with God. Those are all different things that had to be provided. He provided for every bit of that. I'm just saying it's a marvelous thing. Okay, so uh, Galatians 2.19. Oh, well... Look, <laughs> it's in the PowerPoint. <laughs> I just had it on the wrong spot. You had to be capable of functioning. You had to faithfully perform. And um, all right. In other words, the Redeemer had to be faithful in the performance of his redemption. So that's where, that's where this has come from. All those times that I've used that. Okay. Now... There's the Ephesians 3.11 verse. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Him. The only reason we have boldness and access is because of what He faithfully performed. There's not a thing that we did to get that. Okay, and now Galatians 2.19. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. This is the next verse, very familiar. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I... But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You're not living off of his belief in something else. You're, the fact that you, the life which you now live in the flesh, you live because he faithfully performed something to make that possible. Everybody seeing that? Okay. So, look, in my early years as a preacher, I memorized that verse, Galatians 2.20. I had no idea what was really going on with that. Uh, you know, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of God. You know, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. You know, I had spiritual applications and all that kind of stuff. I just didn't realize what this verse was really talking about. Uh, after all those years. Okay. Um, that being said, back to Romans chapter 11, verse 20. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and, you, and thou standest, and what was the standest? Not our standing in Christ that we got when we got saved, because every Gentile that got plugged in the tree doesn't have a standing in Christ. The standing, the standest, has to do with, you're no longer over here, but now you're here. And do you know why you're able to be here? Do you know why these branches are able to be grafted into the good olive tree? It's by, see, I know it just says by faith, but it is by the, the faithful performance 
of Jesus Christ that even allows us Gentiles to be grafted over here and get that chance to be dealt with. See, that, was pro I, that faith is not talking about us believing something. I think it's talking about something being performed for us. And to me, maybe I'm wrong, but to me, when he's talking about branches being broken off and art thou standest, then I'm talking to, I, I think he's, that's just another way of saying, look, the branches that we're in got broken off. Don't boast against those branches. And you stand in this good olive tree by faith. Not you believe something because all Gentiles don't believe something. We're in that good olive tree by, the, by faith. In other words, someone's faithful performance. And then that next part of the verse, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou will say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. In other words, the only reason you get to be in there is because of something that was done for you. Now, if you want to say, that standing is in Christ and the faith is your faith in Him that made it possible, then you're going to have a problem with the last part of the verse, be not high-minded, but fear. Because if you're talking to saved people, then He's going to fix to talk about branches being broken off. So if you're making all this about salvation... Now you're going to be talking about losing that salvation. That is not what this is talking about. So, Mike, wouldn't, wouldn't the, by faith be the faithfulness of God? Yes. Yes. Well, that's true. That's true. Right. You know, they, they rejected God, so God therefore goes and goes, okay, well, I'm going to give all my goodness to start working with the Gentiles. That's exactly right. Yes, that's, that is, that's the way it ought to be looked at. Yes. So God, yeah, it's the goodness of God. Just as he was doing that formally with Israel, now he is doing that with the Gentiles. And you see how we can't equivocate that with salvation, but the opportunity for salvation. God working with us. Okay, thank you. That was well done. Anyone else? Everybody get that? Okay. So, where are we here? Where am I at? Okay. Alright, so look. Here's what we're going to do. Because now we're about to move to the next section. It's a perfect place to take a break. So we'll stop here. We'll take a break. And then we'll come back and we'll pick up the last session. Do you have a question, Linda? See, no, no, no. That's what, yeah, none of this has a, with salvation. And that's why, but see, if you, if you say the standing is in Christ, now you're forced to see verse 21 as a threat against salvation. Yeah, but if you're talking to Gentiles in general, and they're not all saved, so you're not talking about salvation, what are you talking about? Huh? The goodness. the goodness? All right. And along with that goodness, yes, what you're talking about is an end to the opportunity to be dealt with now by God. And see, isn't that different from the end of your salvation? <laughs> Big difference. Uh, Milt? The way I see this up here is that uh, the standeth by faith, that's the standing of faith. Yeah. The I see. So the, the, the faith there is that if you believe, you'll be in there. You'll be in. If you do not believe, you'll be broken off the table. Just like the 
That would be, and that's a true statement. That's how Israel got broken off. That would be a true statement. Right. Okay. All right, so let's stop here. We'll take our break, and then we'll come back.